Uh, now, it is time for the panel discussion uh, about BRICS, as we just heard from Jim uh, Rickards, uh, a beautiful discussion of, of BRICS, really a deep dive into it. Uh, the moderator is going to be Albert Liu, and I, you know, we heard him this morning. What a fabulous talk he gave. Uh, we're going to have Rick Rule, obviously, on the panel, Jim Rickards, uh, my dear colleague, Matthew Pippenberg uh, is... Uh, Oh, there, there we are, he's right there. So uh, with that, I invite everyone up onto the stage. I will get out of their uh, way and out of your line of sight and hand the, hand the floor over to Mr. Albert Liu, who will absolutely penetrate these guys with you know, insightful questions. So let's, uh, let's give a warm welcome. And... All right, thank you, Byron. Uh, Rick, I know that we normally save the what have we learned for the last day, but I'm going to jump in with one now. I'm, I'm really glad I didn't try to do a BRICS talk before James Rickards. <laughs> I'm going to just stick to talking about clothes, I think. That was a great talk. Um, so my purpose is not to rehash the details uh, of that talk necessarily, but maybe get into some of the whys. Um, and guys, uh, I'd like it to be an organic discussion, so please don't be too polite waiting for your turn, just if you have something to add, uh, just Except get for you, the Jim. discussion. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the title, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll ask James to comment uh, a little bit on that first for background purposes, but uh, you know, John Connolly's, uh, it's our currency, but your problem. I, I chose that uh, because Maybe the irony of it that if this BRICS currency comes to fruition, their currency, or more uh, accurately, our currency will be our own problem. Uh, so maybe we'll start with that setup, James. Maybe a comment on, on Connolly, Nixon, the whole situation back then, and what he meant. Yeah, I mean, Connolly was in Texas, so they know a thing or two about money. Uh, and yeah, is our currency your problem? He said famously in the, uh, um, in, in the 19, uh, 1970s. But, um, you can turn that around and say, yeah, it's, it's our currency, the dollar, it's your problem, the rest of the world, and the rest of the world says, you're right, and we're not going to solve the problem. And here's our solution. Because in the day, in the 1970s, the, the unfinished part of that sentence was, you got to devalue. They wanted, uh, sorry, revalue, revalue upwards. They wanted to devalue the dollar. They wanted the Japanese yen, and this is pre-euro, so it was the German Deutsche Mark, Japanese yen, and, uh, um, and UK sterling. Uh, they wanted to revalue those upwards between 15 and 17 percent. The Japanese were considered the worst offenders and they did actually uh, revalue the yuan upwards by that amount. So that was the solution to the problem. Uh, here the solution, the problem is much bigger. It's not just about uh, you know, dollar inflation and uh, dollar debt. Those are all long-term problems, not going away, they are serious, but it's, it's the weaponization of the dollar. That's, that's the, the turning point. That's the inflection point. It's like, oh, you're not just stealing our money with inflation. You're actually telling us we can't get it back with or without inflation. Uh, and using the economic sanctions to win a war that never should have started. Uh, you know, you got a bunch of warmongers in the State Department. Uh, so, so it needed a much bigger response. And they've been talking about it for 20 years. And it, it was, Another point I was making is that uh, the end of the dollar, you know, the dollar's going to crash, uh, the, the petro yuan is coming and all this stuff, which I never brought into. There's serious dollar problems for sure. But those solutions never added up. Yeah. James, can but, I interrupt for a but second But finally, they, did, they do. On this point, um, because uh, that was my next question, is um, debasement versus weaponization. And I think, Rick, we've had conversations before. It seemed like foreign investors were content to uh, put up with the depreciation. It was deep enough, it was liquid enough, it was predictable enough that they were willing to go along with the depreciation and the debasement. But weaponization seems to be a different matter. Uh, so thoughts on that? I, I think that's true. I think those are twin evils there, though. I think that from the point of view of some foreign investors, the combination of the weaponization uh, and the pace of debasement was just more than they could take. Uh, the arithmetic around maintaining savings uh, for a two and a half or three percent coupon in a currency where the purchasing power was being eroded at seven percent at the same time that the uh, creditor uh, 
was your enemy was just a cross too great to bear. I related a story to you, Albert, when I was getting dragged around the world uh, selling Sprott product to sovereign wealth funds. And I won't go too deeply into that, but I had occasion to pitch an Asian sovereign wealth fund that had over a trillion dollars in U.S. treasuries. And I said, first of all, you know, thank you, that's very flattering. It seems to me that we're sending you pieces of paper with dreams painted on them and you're sending us ships and computers and cars. From my point of view, this is all very cool, you know. Uh, and I said, you know, I relate the value proposition to them. And I said, doesn't this feel a little bit like a lie? Mm -hmm. And my counterparty said, uh, yes, of course, Rick, but yours is a deep and transparent and liquid lie unlike the lies everyone else tells us. <laughs> and I found that, you know, I found that very enlightening. And then I said, sir, do you trust us? He laughed, said, of course not. But those of us outside the U.S. trust you more than we trust each other. Sadly, we're debasing what de Gaulle described as our exorbitant privilege. In yeah. addition to the fact that the arithmetic around U.S. Treasury securities is in a colloquial word in English, shitty. Uh, well, that, that we genie are, is out of the bottle now. We are weaponizing, yeah. as Jim points out, that medium of exchange. Uh, as he, Jim, really, really, really pointed out correctly, uh, the enemy of the U.S. dollar isn't in Beijing or Moscow or Riyadh. It's in Washington which is a pity. I think that's an interesting point. It's the point. And it's just fascinating because none of us got on a phone and discussed this in February or March of 2022. It was so patently obvious we'd gone too far, like Napoleon going into Moscow. Right. And we went too far. And it's fascinating to me that in 1960, Robert Triffin was in Congress warning against weaponizing the, the right. world reserve currency. John Maynard Keynes was warning against this. Even Obama said, be careful. You can play this game with Venezuela or Iran when you're pushing it against China or Russia. It's fascinating that we even got to this problem, but our currency, your problem, it's now our currency, our problem, in my opinion. I think the real enemy isn't from without, it's from within. It is at, at Constitution Ave, it's the Eccles Building, it's policy, it's at the White House. I'm amazed that we got to this point, but what fascinates me right now when you talk about our currency, our problem, the gap right now between foreign buyers of U.S. IOUs, U.S. Treasuries, and our deficit is where it was around the COVID crisis in 2020. We all know what the Fed had to do to fill that gap. And I, I guess I'd like to know well, all of our thoughts on where's that money coming from if it's not going to be outside of our shores, and if it's not uh, the shadow banking system or the U.S. tax payer and bond buyer, it's going to have to come from a mouse click. And that, to me, is an inherently inflationary response to a deflationary policy right now. It's probably a different discussion. Yeah. Well, isn't it, though, because we created that gap, because now there's not enough buyers of our U.S. Treasuries and there's not enough trust in our dollar because we weaponized it. And so the, the domino effect of weaponizing a world reserve currency is lost. There's no coincidence that within that time there was a dumping offshore outside of the U.S. of our IOUs. Matthew, concerning your uh, Napoleon analogy, I hope it doesn't strictly hold this. Didn't he get decimated on the retreat? Well, he came in with 422,000 in the Grand Army and 10,000 marched out. So it was a Pyrrhic victory. He did get Moscow and maybe... Um, maybe Powell will get target 2% inflation, but I do think we're going to hit fiscal dominance because of what we've done to the trust in that currency and that dollar. Let, let's, let's back up a little bit and talk about the, sort of the inception, because BRICS started, it was a uh, classification, it was an acronym, it was, right, it's all kinds of things, and, and it seems to be evolving from an economic union, maybe a currency union, maybe a political union. I saw a news uh, headline yesterday that that Russia was actually going to grant space station access to BRICS members. So, so we should talk about what it is and, and why it came into being. And what makes sense to me is that there are people um, who feel like the institutions that were created post-World War II, UN, Bretton Woods, IMF, World Bank, they're not serving them. I mean, that, that absolutely makes sense, right? So, G7 is, uh, is really not what it used to be. The G20 um, is, is more broad, but still the representation is not there as far as... And th these are not value judgments I'm making. I'm just repeating what I've heard people from those countries say. So 
is this a necessary migration? Because those people, you know, I saw something actually, um, China secretly wants to be the United States. Well, what's the secret about that? Everyone wants to be America, right? That's not a secret, right? Everyone wants to be prosperous. I think all of these people would have been happy to be in our club, but they couldn't get in our club. And so they're starting their own. So I don't know, Rick, you want to start? We'll go down. I want to go down the line on this one. So what are your thoughts? I, I don't think it's probably quite that simple. Uh, I think that the way you started out, which is to say everyone has their own interests, uh, means that they have come to believe that they don't have a second choice. Uh, we've given them, first of all, a lousy deal, uh, and we've used our seniorage, uh, our exorbitant privilege, as a weapon. I think that almost every country in the world, were they able to settle in U.S. dollars, given what the U.S. dollar used to be, or even uh, if they were able to invest in U.S. treasuries and lose purchasing power slowly, would probably have preferred to do it. But that deal isn't on offer. <laughs> what happens is that you lose purchasing power rapidly and you consign yourself to the extraterritorial imposition of US values and power, which from other people's point of view is just a lousy deal. Right, so, so an example would be uh, two countries carrying out a transaction that is legal in their countries Yes. Uh, but being sanctioned by the U.S., um, you can understand why they wouldn't like that, right? It, at, from my point of view, uh, absolutely. I don't like being told what to do, yeah. uh, particularly if I'm not allowed to do something that is in my interest and is also in the interest of my customer. Uh, the idea that there's a third party that interposes himself or herself between me and my customer, and I am delivering value to a customer that's purchasing my good or services, my good or service freely, and a competitor of mine, as an example, or somebody who just doesn't like me, gets in the way of that transaction and says you can't do it. Right. If you personalize it, that's what we're doing. Um, Matt, I want to go back to something that you said in your interview with Rick prior to the event, mm -hmm. and that is noticing the difference between fist bumps and handshakes, mm -hmm. and how uh, sort of the, the diplomatic landscape mm -hmm. appears to be shifting. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. seems to be declining mm -hmm. uh, in power. How does BRICS enable it? Are they related? How does BRICS enable that? It's, it's so many kind of stovepipe ramifications of that fist pump. And we can, can you remind people what that was? What um, uh, Biden was? had come out you know, to Saudi Arabia and met with the crown prince and got a nice fist pump from the crown prince. And as a second picture was Xi getting a nice handshake. And there was a symbolic sense of there's been a great shift since the OPEC days of Kissinger in, in the early 70s and now the U.S. under Biden and the, the, this lack of credibility, not only in the White House, but this lack of credibility from the Fed, this lack of credibility post-Afghanistan, post the, so many areas where America doesn't seem to be the America that it was in 1944 or the America that it was under Kissinger in the early 70s when we were able to strike a deal when Kissinger was running around between Iran and OPEC and Saudi Arabia and oil went up $400 in, in literally six months and there was this sense that Volcker could raise interest rates by 15% to make sure Saudi Arabia would take our dollar and would take our U.S. Treasury. Because you have to remember, in the 70s, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that gold would be, I mean, excuse me, that the U.S. dollar would be part of the petro system, that there would be a petrodollar. And I think raising rates by 15% and having real rates at 8% made Saudi Arabia and the OPEC countries say, okay, we can do this. That's a strong U.S. dollar. That's a strong treasury. Well, now you fast forward to 2023, and what does Biden have? An unloved U.S. treasury and a dollar that's indebted over its skis and is getting devalued day by day versus real assets. And if you look at the gold price, or excuse me, the oil price, when the dollar was backed by gold and starting in the 70s versus when when we went off the gold standard, excuse me, in the 70s. When you look at that steady line of stable oil pricing, and then you see what happens post fiat dollar based petrodollar, the, the volatility is enormous. And you, again, I don't think we need to get into a conspiracy that the, the petrodollar is over and it's going to happen next week, but I think, look, Russia is the biggest, one of the biggest oil exporters, and China is one of the biggest importers, and now they're looking more interesting to Saudi Arabia than the US. And the question has to be, 
Has the U.S. dollar lost credibility vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the petrodollar? Has the U.S. White House and the U.S. Central Bank lost credibility after debasing years and years of death by a thousand cuts, of going further and further into debt, monetizing that debt with mouse click money, and debasing the value of the U.S. Treasury by raising rates 500 basis points in a year? That Treasury isn't what it used to be. That dollar isn't what it used to be. That petrodollar is what it used to be. And that White House isn't what it used to be. So there's a lot behind a simple fist pump versus a handshake, and I don't know if you guys have a different theory on the petrodollar or the, or the politics in, South, in, South, in, in that section, but uh, I don't think it's the next thing that's gonna break the dollar anytime soon. I, I just don't, but it's still a telling image. Yes. I mean, you know, when people talk about the dollar going down or breaking the dollar or anything like that, and I was I talked to some of the audience members questions after um, the presentation, I always call a timeout and say, compared to what? Because when you say, is the dollar going up or down? Well, is it, is it Euro, US dollar cross rate? You're looking at FXY or, or uh, uh, DXY? Uh, or you're looking at gold? I mean, you have to come up with what's called the numerator, your way of measuring it. And most people are very sloppy about that. They, they look at cross exchange rates or other, or remember commodity prices, et cetera. I use gold just because I think it, it's the best uh, um, the best measuring stick, and it's not a currency, so it, it's good for that purpose. But I, I would also, uh, uh, Matt mentioned John Maynard Keynes, and I think that's a really important aspect of this. I don't want to spend too much time on history because we want to look forward. But um, what the, what the Ru Russians have done, and call it the BRICS, but it's really Russia and China, and China's a little distracted with things right now. They're whacking their uh, foreign minister. But, um, but Russia's really been the driver of this to a great extent. If you look at the membership of all the organizations, I mentioned the SCO, the EU, and the BRICS, the only country that's in all three is Russia. Uh, so that's, again, part of the driver of this, this um, convergence. But Keynes went through the same thing at Bretton Woods, and I've read all the papers. And Keynes has this reputation as this, you know, gold basher, gold's a barbarous relic, and all that. He never said that about gold, by the way. Um, I, I tracked on a 1926 first edition of his book and looked it up. He wasn't talking about gold. He was talking about the gold exchange standard of the time, which was a, a mess. Um, but at critical junctures, including the outbreak of World War I and again at Bretton Woods, gold was, uh, Keynes was a strong advocate for a gold standard. And he designed something at Bretton Woods called the Bancor, which was world money. He said, it can't be the dollar, it can't be any other currency, Sterling's day has come and gone. We need something new, we're gonna have an international monetary system. So he called it the banker. It was completely theoretical, but it, was, it could be issued and it was new money. And he defined it, uh, well, he started out looking at a commodity basket. So, you know, so many barrels of oil, so many uh, bushels of wheat, so many tons of copper or whatever. And he struggled with that. And then he realized that commodities aren't quite as, uh, uh, homogeneous as people imagine. You know, there are actually 70, 72 different kinds of oil based on viscosity and sulfur content, insurance, transportation costs, and all that. So he says, it's not as easy as it sounds. You got a bunch of corn and it goes rotten in the silo, and then what do you do? Um, so he got to gold. He didn't start with gold, but he got to gold because it's, uh, it's not even a molecule, it's an, it's an atom, it's atomic number 79. It's, just, it, it's either gold or it's not, but you don't have to debate it like anything else. So he got to gold through a process of elimination. And, and I knew that history. And when I saw what Sergei Lavrov and, uh, and the Russians were doing, if you go back a year, some of the early publications on this book's currency that's coming, they said, yeah, we're looking at a commodity basket. You know, Brazil's got soybeans and China's got rice and we got wheat and all this stuff. And I just, I said to myself, I said, they're gonna end up with gold for the same reason that Keynes did. They're gonna have the same journey he did in 1944, because it's really the only thing that works if you want to anchor it to something other than uh, another currency. Uh, and and they, have, uh, they have ended up there. Most of what goes under the name of Keynesianism today is, is nothing to do with Keynes. It was really um, uh, Paul Samuelson and a bunch of eggheads in the 1950s cooking up all this stuff. Keynes was not an ideologue. He was a pragmatist. He, he said, let's do what works. And if something changed, he would change whatever he was doing. So let's keep doing Can what I just works. Comment on that for a second. It's, it's so often in life, uh, the approach is, what you need is the thing that I have, <laughs> whether it's true or not. And maybe, but that maybe that's part of the justification for Belt and Road and all these things is letting people, letting the developing world use what they have. Um, but uh, I, I want to go to Rick now uh, because at the end of the day. What I want to know is, 
if this happens, and we, you know, we don't know what it's going to look like exactly, but it seems like the wheels are in motion, it's going to happen. What does it mean for me? Because every path I follow, it, it seems to point to more expensive things. So dollar demand dropping, more inflation, uh, and then it's, it's hard not to think of this uh, in conjunction with Belt and Road and the Development Bank and whatnot. Um, interest rates being higher, capital being harder to access. Like what, Rick, what, what is the bottom line for us if all this happens? Where are we going to see it? With the caveat, uh, Albert, that I consign geopolitical thinking to James, uh, I'm a used money salesman, basically. That's what I do. I'm not an economist. Uh, when I look at the whole BRICS thing, and people regard it as a currency, I don't think it'll ever, ever be a common currency. I think it'll be a medium for settlement. Uh, the idea that this is a gold-backed currency, which sells a hell of a lot of newsletters, uh, I think is silly. If you were to take, let's say that you got 100,000 bricks, and you went to Moscow and said, give me your gold, good luck with that, yeah. right? They have their own sovereign courts, they have their own guns. The idea that you might, as an individual, trade in your bricks for gold. Okay. Now, is, Rick, that was never my understanding. Do the other panelists agree? This is a settlement it, method. It's it, not it is meant to be a common currency. It is, however, uh, the understanding that's being used to sell newsletters. <laughs> Uh, the U.S. dollar, in addition to be, being a medium of exchange, is a currency. I think that the BRICS probably has a future uh, as a settlement mechanism. I, I think the problem with that is that there are some countries within the BRICS that are on a global scale productive, and then they have other countries like Argentina. Uh, and at the end of the exercise, the productive countries will end up with the BRICS, and the unproductive countries will end up with the debts. Uh, and for those countries, it won't work. I think that the importance for Americans is twofold. Uh, one, uh, I think that if the circumstance that uh, Mr. Rickards is describing comes to pass, that there will be an increasing recognition around the world that gold matters and gold is. And I think that's important. If the logical conclusion of the people who organize financial exchanges of the world is that despite whatever failures it might have, the gold matters, then gold matters. I think for Americans, there's a, another thing to consider, which is to say the exorbitant privilege that we've enjoyed, the ability to monetize our collective stupidity, uh, the ability to export the fact that we consume more than we produce ends over time. Given the fact that we've spent 60 years being spoiled, if we spend 20 years becoming unspoiled, that'll be a very unpleasant process. The other thing I think, Albert, and this is, you can trust me, of course, to be commercial. Uh, I'm interested in the fact that uh, in the virtual part of this conference, there's 700 people out there in 33 countries. And I really look forward to reading the comments that people who aren't American, this, this panel is three and a half Americans, <laughs> with deference to my American-originated European friend. Uh, and I'm interested in hearing the discussion that will take place among non-American participants to this discovery. Because obviously, given our own nationalities and our own benefits, uh, our, our discussion uh, of these policies and their consequences is unavoidably American. Yeah. And the issue is very, the issue is much broader. Okay, what, what I hear is you're agreeing with my thesis to an extent that the things are gonna get more expensive. Back in the day, I remember reading when we used to print $100 bills, um, I read that there were, we, we would spend 17 cents and in return get $100 worth of foreign merchandise. That's when we used to print them. Uh, Pretty good deal. Yeah. It was a great deal. Um, that deal is coming to an end. I don't know how quickly, but that, that deal is going to come to an end. Um, Matthew, do you uh, agree with James in that uh, what's going on here? This thing is eventually going to sort of uh, result in a classical gold center, so not an exchange, not Bretton Woods, not, a class, not, a, not an exchange standard, mm -hmm. uh, but a classical gold standard, do you actually see that happening? I'm gonna 
steal a little bit of Rick's uh, insights from this to answer your question about James. I do think a few things we can take away. I'll make a couple points and answer that directly. I do think de-dollaration is a trajectory and a trend that's now unavoidable, the magnitude of which is going to be open for discussion and speculation. I think the distrust of the dollar and the voting rights of certain countries at the IMF versus the amount of resources they have is causing them to rethink being bullied by a dollar that has less and less power. And there's one way to make as a trading currency, as opposed to a national sovereign currency, more trustworthy among otherwise countries that wouldn't trust themselves, gold gives that trust that the actual relationships or cohesions in the BRICS Plus or the SCO or you bring in the European uh, Economic Union. You can get 41 plus country codes who don't maybe trust each other's interests, but they'll trust that common currency back, trading currency backed by gold. In terms of a sovereign currency backed by gold, I call it my Nietzsche thesis, the Nixon thesis. I don't trust politicians, I certainly don't trust national leaders, and I certainly don't trust central bankers to give up power. The will to power in a, in a politician's office is, would make Nietzsche blush. Why would they want to remove, uh, why would they want to add a chaperone to a fiat currency, a national currency? Why would they want to make a sovereign currency uh, held by a golden chaperone? For a trading currency, that builds trust. For a sovereign currency, which is dreamable theoretically by the citizens, there's a reason Nixon jumped off the gold window in 71. It wasn't what's best for America. It's what's best to have unfettered access to more liquidity, to buy votes before Watergate, by the way. But I'm going to do this, and by the way, he said that would be temporary in August of 71, and he said it would like have no effect tax. on the dollar. And, like income and, tax was temporary. You know, that, was my, that was a year after I was born, and I've known nothing but a fiat currency my whole life. And I, again, there are exceptions, there are profiles and courage, as Kennedy would say, but most politicians have one aim. It's a Nietzschean will to power to stay elected or get a Nobel Prize for solving a debt crisis with more debt. And so why would you want to have a gold-backed euro or a gold-backed dollar if that limits my ability to print at will or mouse look at will when I need more liquidity for re-election, to control my yields, to monetize my bonds? Uh, there's a lot of temptation, and even if you had a gold standard, can you keep it for how long? And would you, would you be able to resist that temptation to go to any of us who had a money clear, a mouse printer in our basement, if we could legally use it, and the mortgage was due, the tuition was due, and we needed a vacation, who wouldn't be tempted to go down there and click another zero onto our checking account? And eventually, I think sovereigns will be unable to resist the temptation uh, unless there is a world of classic liberal economics where we really do trust each other, we, we agree to a common chaperone, maybe a, uh, a Bretton Woods 2.0 where we have a central bank digital currency and all the central banks and we agree to a common coverage ratio and we all sign on to that. Good luck in a post-weaponized uh, world. Good luck in a post-2022 February, March world to get everyone on board for that. So I still see bifurcation as inevitable. I see the seduction to create fiat money in some form as inevitable, and I hope I'm wrong. It would be great if we could all have that chaperone. I just don't see it. Uh, uh, Matt, I think the reason to go to a gold standard with a dollar or even uh, s pretend, signal that you're going to, is when you see the edge of the cliff, right? Because mm -hmm. everyone knows that it does end in uh, a wreck going over. Mm -hmm. but, but we haven't been able to see the cliff. Mm -hmm. Once you can see the cliff, they've got to do something. They can't just keep accelerating toward the edge. No, no. And, and, but right? think of how many countries have already gone over that cliff. Look at our MO. When rates are low, we, you know, emerging market countries from Latin America, to, uh, developing economies over the world, they go into a credit boom, they borrow at low rates, then rates go up, then there's a credit bust. And that's the MO of how we export our monetary policy to the rest of the world. That world's getting tired of that policy. Being beholden to, being whipsawed by American monetary policy, American rate policies, American place, the, the confessions of an economic hitman touch on these themes. It's already a cliff for Argentina. It's already a cliff for other countries who've done this for decades. I'm not blaming that all on the US. There are problems inherent in emerging market countries, but our balance sheet is effectively a glorified banana republic. So really, do you want to emulate that? But we are the world reserve currency. That's harder to dethrone, that's harder to kill. But we are at a cliff. It's been death by a thousand cuts. The, the US dollar uh, has, again, lost massive amounts of purchasing power since we saved uh, since we got off the gold standard so Nixon could get reelected and then kicked out during Watergate. Um, I think the pain is already felt in emerging markets. That's why the BRICS are getting momentum. That's why they're trying to come together. That's why Russia and China have been waiting for this opportunity that we handed them last year to get outside of the dollar. Whether that's gold-backed or not, the de-dollaration trend is already optically very important for weakening the dollar. 
And as we raise rates and destroy the value of our U.S. IOUs, that also is weakening U.S. credibility. So we have to do something. I think we'll probably cry uncle and blame it all on Putin and then COVID and then get together and do a reset somehow and maybe do a central bank digital currency in the name of your interest, your national interest, and we'll find some real asset like gold to back it partially. Okay. That maybe will happen. Fortunately, we're out of time, but Rick, in 10 seconds, some advice for people. What, what should, they, should they take from this panel? I, again, this sounds commercial, but I think the unanimity uh, on this panel would be in terms of what we're doing with our own portfolio, uh, buy a little gold, <laughs> hang on tight, and pray that what we're afraid might happen doesn't happen. Yeah. Great <laughs> advice. Thank you very much.